So let's do a footnote here, please. Um, I don't want anybody to have a misconception mm -hmm. about you that you hate businesses and you uh. want businesses to walk mm -hmm. away. Could you give us a footnote? Sure, please? sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, we we need good businesses. We really do. And in Richmond, we we welcomed many green businesses, many clean tech businesses. That was our our whole effort was to not have one business, the Chevron refinery, dominate the whole scene. We wanted uh, diversity in our business community. And, but we also require businesses to do right by the community, not harm our community. So we really, in the RPA, and I do this statewide, we should lift up our small business community. You know, small businesses provide the highest number of jobs. So we need to really build up that small business economy. We, and with the larger and mid-sized businesses, we just have to hold them accountable and have them pay their fair share of taxes. And of course, we want to welcome those clean tech and green businesses. Uh, I won't challenge you on your statement that the small businesses hire mm. more, uh, create more jobs. That's, That's an absolute contradiction to uh, what the White House says. I know, <laughs> yeah. Well, there have been many studies that say 80% of all new jobs come from small businesses. So, <laughs> so now, um, why are we running for the second place in, in California uh, politics? Mm -hmm. uh, what are you trying to say? Uh, if I'm not your first choice, should I be your? Uh, should be vote for you second? Why? Mm -hmm. Rather second? than governor, huh? So you know, I think some of us in the RPA sat down and, and talked about what would be the best seat to run for. I think we decided on lieutenant governor because it's a position that we can make into what we want it to. There are specific responsibilities and roles without a without a doubt. Um, the Lieutenant Governor sits on the UC Board of Regents and on the State Lands Commission and on the California Economic Development Commission and, and many others, the Coastal Commission. And all these commissions and boards offer opportunities for mobilizing because um, you know, I will sit on the seat, I will use my bully pulpit to share the, the needs of the people, but also there will be people that will be coming to, to um, speak at these meetings. That's part of my role, uh, as I see it, to organize and work shoulder to shoulder with organizations so that the other legislators, the other people sitting on these boards and commissions, hear not only my voice, but from the people as a whole, so that they will change their votes to vote for things like a public bank and for things like um, truly affordable housing. So that was one of the reasons, because we, we can make it, there, there aren't the, the level of um, responsibilities that the gubernatorial position has, although if the governor is out of town, the lieutenant governor steps up as acting governor. So, you know, I take that responsibility very seriously, but at the same time, what I really see as the, the impetus for change is working with the community, mobilizing and um, building a movement, a statewide movement, so that it's clear to, in the state legislature, to the state senators and the state assembly people, that it's not just me, Gail, Lieutenant Governor speaking, but it's uh, you know hundreds of thousands of people who are standing together and you know having a voice from a statewide elected official making space for their voice is something I want to do. I believe that the lieutenant governor, governor position allows me more elbow room to get that mobilized effort going and to, you know, to put the pressure on the governor, whoever that is, if need be, to put the pressure on the state legislature, to put the pressure on other executives in statewide governor uh, in the statewide government. And I think it's also an opportunity that um, people will see that this position is one that, um, I think some of the corporate Democrats and corporate Republicans are all going to be focusing their attention on the gubernatorial race. So we think maybe this, this second position here will not have quite the level of opposition. I could be wrong, and if, there, if all the opposition comes to prevent me from taking that seat, I'll fight like crazy to show that my position is with the people, people first, and I believe we'll win it regardless.
Okay, so I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, take your time on this one. Mm -hmm. We're looking at environmental mm -hmm. issues, transportation issues, and technology issues. Mm -hmm. I know it's a mm -hmm. big picture mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Yeah. But if you look at China, how advanced they have become in their renewable energies or just using uh, electric trains, uh, super, super fast trains mm -hmm. at 220 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And the difficulties we have, we cannot even get a, a super fast train to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco to cut mm -hmm. down on a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, polluting uh, cars traveling. Mm -hmm. So talk about big picture and if you mm -hmm. have any details of any of these things, please share with us. Like, mm -hmm. How do you see the future mm -hmm. five years, ten years from now? Yeah, so I think technology plays a really important role in how we advance in California and in our society as, at large. Right now I see unfortunately too much of the technological knowledge and science ending up in the military in you know smart weapons so supposedly smart weapons and such rather than putting them putting the technology um, into serving the people's needs lightening the load of people making our environment healthier so I think we should be putting research and time into technology to serve the people and the people's planet and I believe that we can do that and I believe we can, uh, there will be some challenges and as we automate more in our society, and it is coming, I would like to see it happen faster, but at the same time we have to provide jobs for people and I'm a supporter of a universal minimum income so that everybody has an income regardless of if they've lost their job and have to be retrained for another job, um, if they're homeless. As long as we have this growing inequality of wealth and this high poverty rate and we have this changing society that's going to lay off a lot of people uh, as automation happens, we need to give people at least a basic income so they can move forward in their life in whatever that means, more education, more job training, getting a home. Um, and, and that, there's a lot of people working on this. And I, I think other uh, countries have done it. There's a city in California, Stockton, that has a pilot program for a universal min minimum income. So I think it's one way that we can help the people as we shift to a techno technology that will, will, in the long run, help people in general and help our planet. We need transportation, high-tech transportation, and we need transport uh, building of housing near transportation so people use that public transit. So it's not just um, you know p building housing you know far enough away that people still feel they have to use their cars. No, we want people out of their cars, into public transit, on their bikes, walking, getting good exercise, and that's a whole lifestyle change. And, and um, we promote it in Richmond. We have a great bicycle path um, uh, plan for the city, and uh, we need to keep going in California to do similarly. So as you know, in China during the Mao's time, bicycles mm -hmm. were a means of transportation, mm -hmm. mass transportation. Mm -hmm. It has come back, but this time it's electric bikes. Ah. <laughs> so to the tunes of millions in each city. So it's mm -hmm. really a good technological advancement yeah, that they yeah. have learned. Technology can help societies. Absolutely. Um, I want to give this um, platform to you now to mm -hmm. um, tell us whatever uh, you wish to our audience, your voters mm -hmm. uh, would like to hear from you. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your message? Uh -huh. What would great. you like people to do for you as much as you want to do for people? Oh, great. Well, thank you again. So um, I would like to just tell people that, that what my campaign is all about is making it clear that our democracy is in peril. We have corporations dominating our state, dominating our country, but California is well known for having this, this corporate dominated governance. If you go to the state capitol you, and you go into the halls of the state buildings, you see corporate lobbyists there influencing all the legislators and we see 
them funding these legislators' campaigns, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars you know, spent from the insurance company, from the oil companies, from the pharmaceutical companies. We need to say that is at the core of our problem. It's, you can't just keep electing corporate dominated candidates and then expect that the policies of the people get put in place because then they become beholden to their corporate donors. So what I'm talking about is building from the grassroots up uh, local movements and a statewide movement and from the local run those local candidates without corporate money run at every level of office without corporate money it can be done it was done in Richmond and then we will have the people sitting in those seats of governance who truly stand with the people and will be able to get single-payer health care for all Medicare for all in place because we won't and we aren't beholden to the insurance company and pharmaceutical companies. We'll get Free College California in place. We won't be um, in debt or beholden to uh, the, big, the big institutions that are controlled by corporations. We will get our public education system uplifted because we're not letting uh, charter schools siphon off uh, some of the kids and, and therefore less funds for everyone in the public school system. And we can do things like reform Prop 13, which uh, has a huge corporate loophole. If we close that corporate loophole and leave Prop 13 for the homeowners as it was meant to be, then we're gonna get $9 billion of extra tax money in our state every year. That can uplift our school system and it could, util it could be utilized for many, many needs. So. My campaign is, is talking about how we need to mobilize and how we need to get our statewide issues in place through this, this galvanizing people power. And it can be done if it was done on a smaller level in one city with three and a half million dollars of Chevron money trying to stop us, it can be done on a statewide level in spite of millions uh, undoubtedly uh, going to our competitors who um, would like to stop us as well. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, could you give an example, what does it mean when you say free education and free healthcare? I mean, mm -hmm. how the money circulates, so okay. you gotta explain that. Uh -huh. So how the money circulates, you mean? If you have a free college, what does uh -huh. it mean for, for a student to be uh, free, tu uh, free tuition right. and then that person gonna get a job in our cities? Uh-huh, so yeah, so what, the way I, I see free college, uh, free public, Pub college, public college, free public college, right, and uh, that would be free tuition. And what that, and there was a time, uh, you know, a few decades back so that, that tuition was free in our public Before universe. Reagan time. That's right, and so now what um, we need to do is get back to giving, uh, offering this free education for every, student who wants to go to I think we should college. change the language to public. I think you're uh, right. Public yeah. free education. Uh, yes, we, we need to get free public education for every student who wants to go and we need to encourage students to go to public college and to better themselves. And the money will come, like I said, from taxing, closing corporate loopholes and taxing the 1% and also for single payer. Um, there are so many methods that we can get it off the ground with taxing the 1%. There's ideas about a gross business um, tax for businesses that are you know, higher in income, bringing in more than a certain amount of money each year would be taxed at, I think it's 2.3%. And that's only to get it off the ground because ultimately single payer Medicare for all is a less expensive um, form of health care and it allows everyone to go into a hospital, a clinic, get their medical needs me met if they have a pre-existing condition, if they have um, an accident, whatever happens to cause a person to be sick or, or um, in a situation where they can't uh, continue with their job and so many people are in that position today and they end up homeless or they end up with monumental health care bills 
that puts them into bankruptcy, well, we would have a different setup. Everyone would know that they could, regardless of what happens to them, their health would be handled by this single payer system. And that's only fair. Human uh, health care is a human right, and it also should not be a commodity. And right now, that's how it's being operated as a commodity, as if you buy your health. That should be something that everyone has a right to. So I'm, you know, I'm fully standing for, for getting the right funding to get single payer off the ground, get free college off the ground, and there are so many ways to tax that top 1%. And uh, a progressive millionaire's tax will bring in billions uh, in additional taxes each year. And the oil extraction tax will bring in um, you know, billions as well. So these are ways that we can fund the people's needs and the planetary needs. And people can learn many more things about my campaign by going to galeforcalifornia.org. That's G-A-Y-L-E-F-O-R. California, the whole word, dot org. And you could look up the issues I'm standing for and all the endorsements I have. And also, if you would like to help with signature gathering, I'm right now uh, in the process of gathering signatures, and we have people up and down the state doing great work, uh, signature gathering, to get me on the ballot. This is in lieu of paying the fee. But you know, gathering signatures not only will help me get on the ballot rather than having to pay the fee, but it really is an organizing uh, tool with people getting to know each other and, and trusting each other and part of this movement building that we need. So we think it's gonna showcase how much grassroots support we have and we're gonna keep doing it um, until it's clear that the people of California are gonna define our own destiny. Well, thank you very much and thanks for your time. I was gonna ask for your contact information, but you uh. gave it, so um, if, if we missed anything you would like to add to, mm -hmm. but um, thank I you. We cover, I think we covered it all. And Mansoor, I am very grateful to you for to holding this interview and helping me spread the message. Oh, thank you very much.